So with that introduction, we now enter into the chapter by chapter study. My thesis of the making of biblical womanhood is really simple. It's that biblical womanhood isn't biblical. I've been teaching in the college classroom since 1998 when I was a graduate student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Although I didn't teach there for very long, looking back, I can see some pretty interesting differences between my public state school students and my private Christian school students now. Two big areas that I can see significant differences, and that is in how my students responded to Paul and to patriarchy. I remember a class that I was teaching. I was actually subbing for a professor, and I was teaching on medieval Christianity and how women were regarded within medieval Christianity. And I started off by talking about the Pauline prescriptions in the New Testament. And I remember a student raised their hand and said, Professor Barr, who's Paul? And that was the moment that I realized my world was different <laughs> because I had never had to explain Paul before to an audience. Well, when I got a job at my current university, Baylor University, I have never had that happen since then. My students not only know Paul, many of them can quote Paul. Even if they are not currently practicing faith, they still know who Paul is. I had the reverse experience, though, with patriarchy. At Chapel Hill, all of my students knew what patriarchy was, and they all believed that it was real. When I got to Baylor, I found that my students, that many of my students, did not know the word patriarchy. Or if they did know it, they only knew it in the context of the biblical patriarchs. And when I talked about what patriarchy was, a system that subordinated women to men, many of them doubted its pervasiveness throughout history. So I would have to start off my classes with a couple of days talking about the reality of patriarchy, which was good practice for me because I have found that just like my students, many Christians who have either read my book or learned about my book have a similar response to the word patriarchy. So I decided when I wrote the book to start off the same way that I did with my students, to explain what patriarchy is. So what is it? I draw on the definition of historian Judith Bennett. Patriarchy is a general system through which women have been and are subordinated to men. It's pretty straightforward. Let me give you another example of patriarchy, a medieval example. This is a practice called coveture. Maybe you've heard of it. It existed in Northwest Europe. Historian Cordelia Beatty defines coveture as the, quote, common law doctrine, which meant wives were under the guardianship of their husband, had no legal possessions of their own, and could not enter into economic contracts in their own name. So what does this mean? This means legally and economically, married women could not engage in business without their husbands and could not even own property on their own. Now, my students always love this part. On the one hand, this could work in the favor of women. If a woman committed a crime with her husband, she might get off while her husband would face the consequences because in front of the court, she had simply obeyed him and was therefore not at fault. A married woman was also not responsible for her debts, even ones that she had incurred. Her husband had to pay him because he covered her. On the other hand, though, coverture reduced married women to the status of a subordinate similar to that of children. Now, there were a lot of loopholes in this system 
It's important to remember that patriarchy is not just a story of male power. It is also a story of women's agency. Women who support, resist, use for their own purposes, and subvert patriarchal structures. At the end of the day, however, women, like the medieval word implies, are considered to be covered by men, which means women are always limited, not for anything they have done, but simply because they are not men. I like how Judith Bennett describes patriarchy in another of her books. She uses the lens of Cecilia Pinnefatter, a 14th century English woman who remained single throughout her life. Bennett writes, Cecilia was born into a world where daughters were less valued than sons. Cecilia supported herself in an economy where women earned lower wages than men, got less training for skilled work, and received smaller endowments from their parents. She cooperated with a community structure that prescribed her from participating in its governance and offices. She relied on a social network that was smaller, narrower, and more focused on nearby neighbors and kin than those of men. As the daughter of well-off parents, Cecilia forged a prosperous and comfortable life for herself. But she was, all things considered, an exceptionally lucky woman." End quote. Now let's just stop for a minute. Maybe there aren't direct modern parallels with everything experienced by Cecilia Pinnefetter today, but there are some. Just think about it for a minute. Are there areas that you know of or perhaps have heard of or perhaps experienced yourself where women, simply because they are women, face limitations that men do not? So now that we've talked about patriarchy, let's talk about complementarianism. One, male headship, men lead. Two, women's submission, women follow male leadership. Three, the gender hierarchy is ordained by God and rooted in scripture. And number four, women are of equal worth but relegated to unequal roles. It is eternal, predating the fall. So, as a scholar, we always go back to the sources, right? So let's go to the sources of complementarians and see how they describe themselves. The beginning of complementarianism which I describe as Christian patriarchy, was born with an organization called the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. I talk quite a bit about this organization in my book. Um, so you can read about that. But let's just talk about the beginning of what they describe as complementarian beliefs. And it starts, I have it right here in front of me, it starts with a meeting they had in 1987 in which they composed what is known as the Danvers Statement. This was published in its final form in 1988. Just listen, we're not gonna read all of it, but just listen to some of what the Danvers Statement says. Part of the rationale behind it was the widespread uncertainty and confusion in our culture regarding the complementary differences between masculinity and femininity. The tragic effects of this confusion, the Danvers statements write, is the unraveling of the fabric of marriage woven by God. The increasing promotion they are also concerned about given to feminist egalitarians who distort or neglect the glad harmony portrayed in scripture between the loving, humble leadership of redeemed husbands and the intelligent, willing support by redeemed wives. Okay, so that's the Danvers Statement. A lot of you may have not heard of it. What about the Baptist faith and message? I bet a lot of you have heard of that. The Southern Baptist, the governing body um, of stating the beliefs of Southern Baptists. 
And the Southern Baptists, I talk about it in The Making of Biblical Womanhood, there is an evolution in what happens to the Baptist faith and message. But by the year 2000, the Baptist faith and message is firmly on board with what we saw articulated in the Danvers Statement. This is what the Baptist faith and message says in its article on the church. It says, its scriptural officers are pastors and deacons. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by scripture. In the article for the family, it states, the husband and wife are of equal worth before God since both are created in God's image. The marriage relationship models the way God relates to his people. A husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. He has the God-given responsibility to provide for, to protect, and to lead his family. A wife is to submit herself graciously to the servant leadership of her husband, even as the church submits to the headship of Christ. She, being in the image of God as is her husband, and thus equal to him, has the God-given responsibility to respect her husband and to serve as his helper in managing the household and nurturing the next generation. So what did you hear from the definition of complementarianism from the two primary complementarian documents? First, we heard male headship men lead. We heard women's submission. Women are called by God to follow male leader, leadership. We heard the gender hierarchy is ordained by God and rooted in scripture. We heard that even though women are of equal worth, they are relegated to unequal roles. And we heard that it is eternal, predating the fall. Short, we heard complementarians in their own voice describe exactly how I described it. Complementarians may not like how their beliefs look when placed in the context of historical patriarchy, but that doesn't change the reality that complementarianism is simply patriarchy. Maybe same song, different verse, it looks a little bit different, but that doesn't make it a different system.